Welcome to the Bearded Banker Podcast, your go-to source for all things mortgage, money, and mindset. I'm your host, Daniel Valencia, and today we have a remarkable guest with us, a true marketing maven, an entrepreneur, and an advocate for financial freedom. Bill Mbua Jr. has been in the sales and marketing industry for over a decade, making waves as a marketing executive who currently heads Elevate Enterprises, a digital marketing and business solutions agency. Bill's passion lies in helping brands soar to new heights using unique strategies like influencer marketing, strategic partnerships, and a game-changing business development slash sales training program that empowers clients to boost their sales and enhance their customer relationships. What's truly remarkable about Bill's journey is his specialization in diverse industries, such as healthcare, automotive, personal finance, and beauty. But that's not all. Bill is also deeply committed to helping people kickstart and scale their online businesses, giving them greater control over their household finances and the chance for financial freedom. Bill's achievements are nothing short of impressive. He's been recognized as one of the top 20 entrepreneurs disrupting their industries in 2023. He's successfully helped over 12 brands achieve six-figure sales through influencer ads and strategic partnerships. And let's not forget his philanthropic endeavors, including the Project Help charity project that provides food and clothing to over 100 families annually. And a little sneak peek for you, Bill's Elevate podcast is set to launch in December 2023, where you can gain more invaluable insights from this marketing maestro. Billy Boy, welcome to the pod, my brother. Thank you, Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Very excited to be here. Excited to have you, man. We've been talking about this for a while. Uh, can't wait for your podcast. You know, definitely want to jump on that. For sure. Uh, sure. and, and make some more magic. So I want to talk to you definitely about all of your expertise with marketing and sales, your background. Um, let's start at the, you know, influencer marketing. So, Mm uh, I guess that's still a thing. Mm -hmm. What has changed with kind of the mega, mega influencers to, to what your agency does now? Um, well, the main thing that has changed in the landscape is Typically, traditionally, what people would do is, you know, when you think about influencer marketing, you think the best way to affect your brand is to to pay a huge influencer and, you know, your sales are going to go through the roof. But what we've seen is that mixing and matching the level of influencer you work with to see which influencer works with you and for your brand the best in terms of return on investment is always the best way to go. You know, when we first started this journey, I remember like yesterday, a brand coming to me like, well, you know, we didn't believe in influencer marketing. We paid this one influencer over $10,000 and nothing happened. And then Mm -hmm. what I explained to them is when we classify an influencer, we classify influencers in three R's. What is their reach? What is their relevance? And what is their relationship? So what is the reach of the influencer to your target demographic as a business? What is the relationship with that influencer and their followers? And what is the relevance to necessarily the project you're promoting and the influencer's target demographic? So those are typically the metrics when you're using, when you're utilizing influencer marketing that you want to use in your strategy and understanding the right influencer to work with your brand. I like that. Three R's. So reach, relationship, relevance. Yes, sir. And you said something there about levels. There's levels Mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. So how do you, I guess, how does Elevate define an influencer? Let's start there, right? Okay. And then the following count and what's, what's, what's the right fit for white, for what brand or, or, or business that you're working with? Believe it or not, it depends on the project, right? Um, there's all levels. Like I said, we have nano influencers, which work just as well, which are people that have under, uh, you know, 5,000, you know, 8,000 or under um, micro influencer, that area, uh, which is, you know, and then we have the mid-level influencer, which is like 100K to 200K. Uh, then the macro influencer, which is like two to 500K, maybe 750. And then a million plus is a major uh, level influencer. And again, the, the 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 gift and the curse to having someone with a million, depending on the project you're promoting and the the concept that you're marketing and selling, um, that depends on what you use and how we classify it 
and to define an influencer, an influencer is anybody that has ability um, and the relationship with their audience to move the needle and, and they take recommendations from them to actually purchase a product, right? So there's people that have a million followers that actually have no influence, right? So they can post all they want, um, but no, no brand and company and business is going to have the needle move. Right. But there's mm. people like sometimes you and I, right? Like I lost my other page. I was sad that I had almost 8K. With, but even with this new page that I built up to 3K now, my new, new personal page, that page, believe it or not, has more influence than people that have 10,000 and 15,000 followers. So to me in 2023, influence is not necessarily a follower count thing, it's an engagement thing. So it's how does your followers engage with uh how do your followers engage with you as a brand right and the thing i love about influencer marketing what it did to us as a society is it taught us that we're our own celebrity right we don't have to idolize i i always say americans we have an unhealthy uh relationship with celebrity right um and even when it could be you touched on you talked about financial literacy you know we look at these big celebrities we're like oh man this person has this they have that but the truth of the matter is you're your own celebrity right if you build your personal brand in a way that companies can relate to you and and and, and brands want to partner with you and then your audience is consuming this brand well you're now an influencer right regardless of your level of followers and you're now a uh a thought leader or a a person of status in that space that you're in so it's really about what's going on behind the curtain like the engagement like you said correct so it's not so much about the follower count because i guess you're right there's people with a lot of followers that (laughs) i wouldn't necessarily listen to for certain advice right they kind of have their niche or people follow them for a certain Mm -hmm. thing and then there's other people that they're almost like tastemakers or Mm -hmm. like they do something that's just cool or like it's something that you want to follow or it's something that you want to look into so for from elevate's perspective Mm -hmm. are you always kind of hunting for people that are nano micro mid-level like you want a a good balance of all types of influencers to have for the brands that you partner with to say hey i think for this brand for you this influencer under 10k would be perfect and then for someone else to be like 50k 200k Mm -hmm. and what we do in each campaign like i said before is we like i said we mix and match i'll put two influencers that are at two or three hundred thousand two or three of those one or two that are at 10k maybe four or five that are at eight to eight five to eight oh so you're in there cooking up a recipe like you're making like okay everything's kind of different soup you know what i mean (laughs) Uh, that could be something man yeah so and that and that is the because you know when we first started this journey when I, we, I was first exposed to influencer marketing in 2016 in California, I'll never forget, you know, that picture of what we saw in, in the kind of influencer land. We had met an influencer there, one of our first brand ambassadors, and she had, you know, I, I always joke about so it's one of those moments. I was 2016, I was single, I'm in LA, and you're like, oh man, you're with pretty girls. Most people would be like, oh, we're going to hit on everybody. And it was one of the first times I was like, oh, let me just learn from this person. And she mm-hmm. brought me and uh, the the group I was with in LA to her uh, her her penthouse um, mm-hmm. where she ran her business out of, and she was making I'll never forget the number over two hundred and thirty thousand a month from her a house, month. white labeling workout equipment, uh, band fitness bands, pro, like just every month was coming in, and she had such influence with athletes and people in the area that she actually didn't pay rent. So that was a huge lesson for me in the value of what marketing could bring as a as a revenue stream. And number two, the the biggest thing is personal brands relationship to actual business transactions, right? So there's there's so many there were so many lessons there. I remember just coming home with like I you know my eyes just wide open. And you and I talk about this all the time. That trip mm-hmm. was just like it changed the game for me because I really started to understand where marketing was going. Um, And number one, you know, when we first started the agency, I always joke, it was hard to keep a client because when you're selling social media management services, every client looks at you and they're like, well, I'm paying you X amount of dollars. What did I make? And we're like, well, wait, we did all this content for you. It's great. We did ads. We did this. You have impressions, right? But nobody can point to sales. And the biggest uh, leverage point and the thing that makes me smile the most is that our job is butts in chairs what i call 
sales and butts and chairs. So when we give a report to a client, I can report to excellent, like one of our doc, uh, our plastic surgeons, just to give you an example, he's an angle with Cliff, shout out to uh, Dr. Farkas, he's one of the best. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he made, in the last 12 months, six figures specifically from our ads he doesn't do any much and he tried to do other marketing he he paid magazines he's done different things and he just looked at me and said bill i'm not getting anything from these other sources so we might as well keep dumping money into the place in the, into where brings us you know the the most revenue back and again in the beauty industry it's a little different right that's like fishing with dynamite um but at the end of the day the strategy itself although it's ever changing the deliverables of the strategy right because the next level of once an influencer posts everybody now they're numb to an influencer app now yeah. you need to create more of an engaging content and create more of what i call a review and a, and, and a truth telling of your experience with somebody to make that recommendation yeah, so it's not just before, like you mentioned 2016, someone with a big following posts a picture of a product and then everyone mm -hmm. goes and buys the product. It mm -hmm. takes a little bit more uh, massaging with the mm -hmm. ad and, and creative mm -hmm. to make it something that's, that's interesting, right? That people, because there's so much noise, man, on social media and so yep. much going on that you have to cut through. So how do these businesses or if someone was, you know, coming to you for assistance, like you said, sometimes with the, the content and the influencer stuff, it could take a little time to mm -hmm. see the traction, right? Because it's like, look, we got all these impressions, got all, this, all these views, all these new eyeballs that you weren't getting, and they just want to see the bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. They just want to see the numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth of the matter is it depends on the campaign, right? Because any beauty campaign, the one thing that we love, you know, like you and I talk about, we love our, li our wives, we love our women, right? But every day we come home, our wives got Amazon packages, throughout, you know, throughout the house every week, there's something new coming in. That's because women consume a little bit different than men do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing an influencer ad that's based in the male demographic, well, that's a lot harder. And I will tell clients, depending on your expectations, which I learned from experience when we first started, we had a client that wasn't happy um, just because I didn't have the, you know, I just believed in the influencer marketing stuff. I didn't have any context to each individual project, how it worked. So mm -hmm. one of the first projects, which I, I admit, so it, it didn't go well um, from a male perspective was because I thought that men consume like women consume. And so what we do is we run a couple month trial. What I do is I try to sign people up for a three month trial because the first month is a test. We're going to get some sales in the first month. But based on the sales that we get from the influencer that works the best, now the second month, now we keep refining the process. And then in month three and four, now we're refining it even more. And now when we have influencers that have consistently given us sales, now we create a brand ambassador program within your business that these influencers consistently now for a year, two years, are promoting the business. Why? Because influ people are, when they look at influencer ads, they're looking at it just like, okay, this girl got paid to go there, right? We're not stupid, we're smart. And like I always say, marketers, we ruin everything, right? So influencer <laughs> marketing, we ruin everything. Every fitness pro, any, every fitness product, protein powder, um, you know, we had done an ad for a, a fitness company, a fitness a franchise last year. And I was just amazed at how the fitness community with certain influencers really gravitates towards the product with no context at all. And mm -hmm. there are certain projects that people need, again, like I said, a lot more massaging, a lot more education, a lot more um, information, a lot more value proposition um, kind of style of marketing for the sales to then come. So if a client tells me I don't have three, four months, I need sales today, I'll either tell them, listen, you know, we're not for you. We might need to set you up with the strategic partner strategy. And the strategic partner strategy is here is another company that we work with or we know that shares your same kind of clientele or target demographic. Why don't you guys create a form and partnership and now you guys exchange business? That way you can get business right away. Right. So that is where uh, one of the best things I think I've done is telling certain companies that reach out to us, depending on what your expectations are, this might not be a good fit for your business. Now, if you're in the beauty healthcare space, it is always a good idea to partner with influencers. If you're in the food restaurant space, it is always a good idea. And when I'm even learning with the financial product space, it is it's always a good idea to provide education. 
right? So if your influencer marketing is provide or your marketing and the beautiful part about the financial space, is it doesn't, you don't need to rely on a hundred thousand or, or 300,000 influencers. That's where you can go to your nano and micro influencer that have a little bit of a community within their town or their region, right? And let them educate the financial uh, literacy. Because one of the things that, you know, we talk about is just, we're, we, we don't, we're not taught about money. Right. Mm -hmm. So the same thing in business, when you're starting a business, we're not taught. So we talk, oh, yeah, let's throw all this money to marketing. But when you're in a business, you have to do what I call an audit of number one, who is your target demographic? Who is your customer really? So most companies do a very lousy job, including us in the beginning, of really, really getting a real good relationship with their perfect customer and knowing them top to bottom. When you know them, you can reverse engineer the deliverables from an influencer ad or strategic partnership. And how to market to, to them, to that person. Yeah, yeah. So let's unpack this, bro. You dropped a lot of gems right there. You Thank see me, I'm taking notes. So <laughs> I definitely want to unpack all of this because a lot of things to hit. So we had Eddie on last week. I love Eddie. You know, Shout our boy, Eddie. Hair by Eddie. Man. And he mentioned something similar in his business with his cuts was like, you got to give me three cuts. Like you can't judge me on the first cut because I'm just learning your, you know, your lines, your hair, mm -hmm. your, you know, how you like to do, you know, whatever. And I have to, I have to learn how to, how to get you where you want to be. So mm -hmm. give me a couple cuts. You said the same thing, like, give me three months for this campaign. Like, let's mm -hmm. see kind of how things go because you have to tweak as you go. Right. I think a mm -hmm. lot of marketing and you could tell me if I'm wrong, but just in, in what I've done and I have a, an interest in marketing. I like marketing. I like seeing what works and what doesn't, but it's a lot of testing. Right. It's a lot of like, let me throw this out and see how it does. And let me try this, you know, split testing or whatever to see what what kind of works, what style works, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what topics work. Back to your uh, your point about knowing your client and kind of like your avatar. Um, so I just wanted to make a point there. The other thing you mentioned was. Starting with influencers, then turning them into like brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So is that a path? That's like a, a, a conscious Absolutely. like influencer to brand ambassador. Absolutely. And then because, from there, a, pro a program around that. Right. Because just to answer that question, the brand ambassador is now your long term relationship. You now deem that this person is valuable to the business. It's like me with my father's business. Right? Mm -hmm. I have a over 10 year relationship as my dad's brand ambassador because he realized like, wow, he promotes on social media. My, I always I, I tell my clients as an example, my dad hated social media, right? He always, mm -hmm. his joke is, I don't want my face on a book. But during the <laughs> pandemic, right, when everybody was locked in, I just decided to pick my son up on my lap and I started doing videos, just giving quick financial tips of things I learned work interning with him and working with him over 10 years. And that so that case study was was I mean, it was beautiful for me in multiple ways. Number one, that I helped the family business grow tremendously. I think we brought on, I think, almost 100 clients that year for my dad from the house with no office visit, um, just in terms of the education and the value. So that taught me about the value in education and information. And not only the information, helping people and, and showing them the steps on how to actually apply it, right? Um, so that information, but the, the brand ambassador relationship is just that some of your influencers are going to rock and roll and some of them aren't going to go so well. They're going to get impressions, but they don't have the engagement. And the only way we can really, yes, we study influencers. So typically before we recruit an influencer, even though every day we get inquiries to the agency pages and the website of influencers that want to work with us or want to be represented by us, because they also know that we get them paid top dollar from other brands. We set them up with long-term success relationships. We actually have a management team um, that is kind of being rebuilt even further now that's going to help an influencer because this is what we talked about before. We want to help them not only just get paid from other brands, we want you to help start an online business that you own. Um, because, you know, if a brand doesn't want to pay you next year, then you don't want to have your income drop in half. You want to, if you're helping a brand make money, you need to make money for your own brand. Um, but mm. that brand ambassador is the long-term relationship versus when you just sign an influencer on, you know, you can have them post once, twice or three times and be like, oh, I didn't get any sales. But believe it or not, sometimes people need to see the consistency in you going to a place or recommending a product sometimes seven to eight times. So once they have that real relationship and your audience realizes like, oh, wow, this is legit. This is not just an ad. This is a legit relationship. She's recommending them. 
they connect those dots and now the consumption start like one of my my plastics one of my other med spots we we're working with he was like, oh you know one of these influencers she didn't work too well you know what do we do we just got some screenshots back and this is a project we started months ago that they're getting patients now from ads that from were work done that was done yeah. months ago so there's a little bit of a timing issue sometimes in some campaigns with certain influencers sometimes certain influencers and brand ambassadors their following needs a little bit more time but once they realize okay this is real this is a real relationship they're really going to this place or they're really using this product they're really going to this restaurant now we're going to go there and we're going to consume which is human nature right because even mm -hmm. if you weren't an influencer you're just my man bill and you're like yeah, yeah. go to this place yeah. I'll take your word for it, but mm -hmm. if I see you there all the time and have a relationship with this place, then I'm like, oh no, this is like this is this is real. Because at the end of the day, we're all looking for authenticity. We all want it to be real, right? So even if someone doesn't have a following, like my wife, she will mm -hmm. plug anyone with her people, whether it's health and wellness or whatever, and she really should start a business of just plugging people because she knows the acupuncturist where to mm. go do yoga, where she gets her hair done. And people always come to her for that kind of stuff. And she's not, quote unquote, an influencer, but she's so authentic in that lifestyle that people just take her word for. And I think that's what we're looking for in influencer marketing. Like, is it mm. real? Like, are you re do you really stand, stand behind this, right? The other thing you said was um, relying on that one partner as an influencer and if they decide to cut their marketing budget which is unfortunately when things get tough the first thing that goes usually in a business is like we're cutting our marketing budget or, or that you know because we got to make sure the business can survive i want to gear this towards my my sales people right because it's mostly mortgage and, and real estate you know mortgage guys will just rely on one realtor relationship mm -hmm. And then if that if that realtor did, you know decides to retire or move to another mm -hmm. state or something it could affect your business and vice versa, if you're a realtor that relies on one lender that sends you all your deals mm -hmm. and then they retire or get out of the business, what are you going to do? You have to build your own marketing funnel. So let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about personal branding. Obviously, mm -hmm. I have mine. You do your thing. Um, what is personal brand from an Elevate perspective? And then are there some successful businesses or people you work with that don't have a personal brand? Like, is it, is it required these days or is it possible to get by without it? So to answer your first question, personal branding is the best way to garner new clients and customers, right? 63% of people do business with people that are attached to or have a personal brand, right? People don't do business with companies. Outside of those bigger corporations like Nike, but those are brands, right? Uh, when, and when you're a brand, a brand is just whether it be personal or product brand, it's a feeling, right? It's not necessarily a company, it's a feeling. It's like when I do, you know, when I, you and I talk and, you know, even when I watch your videos, you educate me so much. And there's, you know, and I, we, you and I have a personal relationship and you inspire the heck out of me. Um, so that is your brand, right? Your brand gives me these positive feelings. So anytime you have anything going on, I'm sharing it, I'm involved, I want to be there because that's what your personal brand does to a guy like myself. So when you have a personal brand where people kind of what I, like we say in sales, right? People like you, know you and trust you. That is the best way to, to gain business. So that kind of old school word of mouth mentality, because the truth of the matter is, like I always like I tell our team, which is why we kind of started to bridge the business development gap um, in relates to influencer marketing, because one of the things that was happening is an influencer will get this uh, a, a store, a brand, a company, all these leads. Right. And now we started auditing. Well, wait a minute. These leads are coming in. How what percentage of these are actually becoming paid customers. Well, that bridge and that lack or where that separation was, was the lack in business development. So business mm. development, before, so once you have your personal brand, and yes, we recommend every business tie a personal brand. So a lot of like our doctors and orthopedic guys and auto dealer principals and even finance guys, like I don't want to get on a camera, but that's the best way you're going to connect with your audience. Like one of my doctors, I had to convince him to do video. And what he started realizing, he was like, you know, you hate to say you told yourself, I told you so. Because mm -hmm. I saw it in my own right. When I was in hospitality, 
marketing in the hospitality space, I was the personal brand that people knew if you wanted to have a good time and you wanted to go hang out, you wanted to go party, you call Bill. That was that. That's what I had built in at that time during that at, in that space. So that was the that would led the, the personal brand led to the success of the events. Yes, the events were cool events, but the personal brand tied it all together. So I think in 2023, personal brand, especially with all the noise online, is the only way for you and I to be unique individuals in the eyes of our potential customer. Because when people see us throw up a video about business or influencer marketing or business development, and the thing I love the most, which is sales, right? When people see us throw that up there, that's like, oh, wow, he knows what he's talking about. I've watched his journey. I've watched his elevation pause, right? I've watched his, el- not a pause, but shameless. Uh, uh, I, wa- intended. <laughs> I watched his elevation. So now I can follow him. And that's the other thing. Part of personal branding is growing with your audience, right? So if your audience knows you for something a year ago, but they're watching you progress, that's how you really build the relationship with the people following you or the people that are, you know, trying to work with you or gauge what to do at the next level, which is become a customer. Well, first of all, likewise, because you inspire me as well, and I appreciate those kind words. And you're definitely the guy that, you know, just you feel good, great energy, big smile all the time, big hug, you know what I mean? A lot of love. And I think that's why people want to party with you. They want to hang out with you. They want to work with you. They want to watch you. And um, I think a lot of people don't know what their brand is. Like, even yeah. you just saying that is like eye opening for me is like, OK, mm-hmm. so I guess that's that's aligned with my brand. Right. Inspiration, education. Um, I think a lot of a lot of service professionals, because it's hard too when you don't have like a physical product, mm-hmm. you're a service mm-hmm. provider, mm-hmm. like a doctor or somebody you're like, look, this is what I do. I didn't sign up to be on camera. I'm not a, you know, like, that's not what I I went to school for. That's not what I thought my career was going to be. But if you're in business, it's a necessary evil of like, this is what, this is what the times are. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this a lot on the podcast with different people is wearing a bunch of different hats. Like you're not just a sales, you know, a car sales guy. You're not just a finance guy. You're not just a guy. Like if you're really trying to build this business, you've got to get out there and you got to go where the intention is. And the attention is on social media. How are you going to break through? And I guess what you're saying is your personal brand is being you, right? Whatever mm-hmm. makes you you and makes you different, and then using that and leveraging that to get in front of people that could potentially know, like, and trust you going back to the sales, you know, basics, right? right. The sales right. Bible, know, like, trust you. So let's piggyback off of that. Um, if you were to, like, let's talk sales a little bit. I know you have like dealership relationships and sales training background. And let's say a dealership calls you in for help. Like mm-hmm. what are the, the top three to five things or a couple of things you're looking at initially and saying, okay, we got to make changes here, here, and here. Is it like on the phones and scripts or is it like we need influencers or is it both? Is it everything? Yeah. So I, when we go into it's funny, one of the new products we're working, which is a, a group that, and, and it's just funny because to, touching back off the previous topic to bridge into the new topic, which is from personal brand, right? I have all these experience. I had all these experiences. I went to, when I graduated college, I couldn't get a job to save my life, right? So it's like, okay, here you are. You got this fancy degree, you can get a job. So I- Yeah, I, for I, what, I went, right? I, yeah, I went, <laughs> I went to school for accounting and I couldn't get a job. And even the jobs that I were offered, it was just like, the money was so low entry level. It was like, you know, luckily we we're living at home at the time, but it's like, is this really it? So when I got so when I first gone for my first accounting job, it was actually in a dealership. And I remember like yesterday, the guy meeting me, ripping my resume up and saying, you need to sell. And I was like, okay, like I never, I went to school for three and a half years, just graduated his degree. Like I didn't think I was going to go sell cars because I didn't look at it in a way that like, do I want to do that with this degree, quote unquote, I got. But the money from the previous job, when I left my state job and went to the car business, it was like three, four times what I was making. And I was a rookie. 
So what I learned in that experience of working in the car business and getting fast tracked to management because, you know, I just had this natural flow with people. I never looked at car sales as like sales. I just had fun all day. If I met somebody, I want you to tell me what you want. I don't know. I'm, I'm new here. I don't know about this car. So let's learn it together. Right. Yeah. You might know more than me. And let's look. And they loved it, right? So one of the things I realized when I when I reflect back on the career and the great mentors I had that even to this day give the agency opportunities to help them, um, the first thing I look for is what's your relationship with your customers over the phone? How do you treat them, right? Because if you want to increase and impact sales, it's number one how you treat and communicate with your customers and the flow. Because I don't believe in scripts. I believe in conversation flow, right? Because people want to be talked to like a regular human being. They don't want to be talked to like a robot. And one of the statements that's key is that people love to buy, but they hate to be sold, right? Mm -hmm. They love to buy, but they hate to be sold. So people love to spend money, Amazon, this, that, and the third. And the thing that Jeff Bezos does a great job at is he gives you an easy way to purchase products, no hassle. So that's the kind of thing we look for. So before we even start consulting for a group, we listen to what they're doing. And then based on experience and based on having a good understanding of who their target demo is, right? So let's say it's a BMW store, a Jeep store, a Nissan store, where each demographic has a different buying strategy. Subaru customer, different buying strategy. So when you understand that and then you kind of hear what the company is currently doing, you're able to move the needle and shift not only their conversation and the structure of their follow-up, right? A lot of 50% dealerships spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on advertising. But one thing that they don't look at is, okay, we have all these customers coming in, but who's, is there a follow-up flow, right? Because, and I'm sure you know this, a big part of selling is following up, right? Because every person is not ready to buy right now. There's mm -hmm. some pocket of your leads that are ready to buy right now, and there's some pocket of your leads that you're going to start to want to build a relationship with, right, that is going to actually come and lead into the sale. And now in 2023, people are no longer just driving up and walking to a, into a store because people have a, a stigma about the auto business that they're going to get ripped off, they're going to get taken advantage of. But what I try to explain to the people we train is that your customer has all the access to the information. So when you're going to a dealership, a tip for people who are buying a car, when you go into a dealership and you're like, well, they're telling you they want to charge you a prep fee. Well, if there's a prep fee with attached to no product, a warranty, a tire and wheel, uh, a factory warranty, you don't have to pay that. Right. So get rid of that when you're negotiating a deal. Now, the customers are reading this online when they're looking at Edmunds.com. So if you're a dealership trying to get away with that, well, you're not going to. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you have a, a genuine conversation with the customer saying, hey, you know, I know I'm listing this car for twenty five grand. I own it for twenty four thousand. Right. Um, if you need me to sell it to you for twenty four thousand, I'll do that. I would love to sell it to you for twenty five thousand. But is there a way we can meet in the middle? Right. So part of negotiation, I always say you get what you negotiate, not what you deserve. Hope you can negotiate what you deserve from mm -hmm. a customer side. It's about them feeling more comfortable about their buy. People will even pay more if they feel comfortable from what they're buying and you're giving a reason. Other dealers, what they used to do is they price gouge you all these fees and it's such a hassle process. You feel like you got to go spend hours. You want to negotiate. So the biggest thing we do is we straight up tell dealers, listen, I get how successful you were during the pandemic. There was limited inventory. Guess what? Those days are over. Now people, they want to deal. They want to feel comfortable. The rates are high as hell. So they want to make sure that they're buying a car that's going to last them and that's good for the money. So you have to educate them and make them feel empowered in the buying structure. So this is where our training is based. Our training is based on selling with the truth, not versus all these scripts and word tracks and all these things to mislead a customer because they could see the information anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So instead of calling 20 dealerships, you could call one dealership, build a relationship with them. And now you have a customer for the next three to five years. So that's the structure in which we train. Nobody wants to be sold, but they love to buy. 
And then I guess you're also looking at that marketing budget. And again, mm -hmm. I'm just digesting everything because, you know, every time you talk, it's just like diamonds <laughs> flying everywhere. And you got to catch them all, you know, Pokemon. <laughs> so you're looking at that marketing budget, a couple hundred grand. Mm -hmm. So there's two sides of it. There's what's going on with your, 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 your calling, your relationship with your client. Are you telling the truth? Are you mm -hmm. taking care of your people? You already mm -hmm. know you're dealing with an educated buyer these days because, like you said, all the information is on the internet already. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at that. Then you're looking at this budget, a couple hundred thousand that dealerships spend on advertising. How can we better deploy that exactly. capital? And maybe there's a there's an influencer uh, market there. Now you mentioned something which I didn't realize we had in, in common. Going to school for accounting, I knew that. But then being in an accounting job, which I didn't know your first one was in a dealership, that makes a lot of sense now. But people telling you, like, what are you doing here? Because I, I started working in accounting and I was out all the time. Shout out to Star, DNR, my, uh, you know, the, the guy that corrupted me in the club life at 17 <laughs> the years goat. old. The GOAT. He'll be on soon for sure. Oh, uh, yes. But um, I'd be out, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then coming to the office and just like beat from the weekend or having these stories or like just having a network and the people I knew and a lot of the accountants I work with being like, what are you doing here? Like you need to be in an industry where you're using that to your benefit. Also looking at the guys that were doing the accounting work and being like, I don't know if I want to be like you when I grow up. Like that's not really, you know what I mean? And it's no disrespect to them. Solid mm -hmm. guys, great life, make good mm -hmm. money. I just don't know if I see myself in that avenue and then I, I ended up in this this mortgage space, which is kind of like the best of both worlds. Shout out to my wife. She definitely put me on, met the team and everything. But it's finance, it's sales, it's a little bit of both. It's using networking. It's obviously being a brand and a personality and, mm -hmm. and putting out this content. So it just kind of aligned. I didn't know that we had that in common, bro. So that's like a little, you know, it makes a lot of sense looking yeah. back at it. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned relationships um which is huge in in that process and i want to talk a little bit about the follow-ups uh i did a, a a podcast my own podcast a couple episodes ago talking about this this 7-eleven rule that i don't know if you've heard of but that mm. uh, a, a lead requires seven hours of interaction and 11 touches on average before they buy and this is mm. a a, a, a is research that was done by Google on people's buying habits and what they're searching online and going back to saying like, you know, people are coming in educated. They might know more, more about the car than you know as a salesperson. It's like, I love that. Like, hey, we're going to learn together. Like, you're going to teach me some things. And really all you're doing is being a consultant, but you're mm -hmm. spending time with them. You're developing that relationship, right? They're getting to know you. You're not pressuring them. It's not high pressure sales. It's like, you know, we're going to we're going to figure this out because you want to leave with a car and I want to sell you a car. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out kind of how we can make this happen where everybody everybody wins. So, yeah, the money is definitely in the follow up in that regard. Um, so where we left off. So going into that now, now this dealership has a couple hundred thousand dollars to play with. That's got to be like your eyes got to get big when you walk in and see that and see some some shortcomings or some shortfalls where you're like, oh, I could take that budget and make magic. Like, how are you how are you looking at that when you step in? So before we, so that's the beautiful part. I think the new structure for us is before we go from the advertising side, we actually go the opposite because one of the biggest things we teach dealers is you're spending all this money on advertising, but you have a database of over 80,000 people here. How are you treating those people? How's your communication with those people? And to your point about 7-Eleven, I have my different way of doing that, which is the sales statistics, I call it. So only... 2% of sales are made on the first contact, right? 3% mm. of sales are made on the second contact, right? 5% are made on the third contact, right? 10% are made on the fourth contact. But guess what? 80% are made on the fifth to the 12th contact. So you go from 2% of sales are made on the first contact, only 2%, but 80% are made on the fifth to the 12th contact. So that's why we teach uh, dealerships and companies we work with, even, and it's funny because the same applies to the surgeons and 
even some of the beauty brands depending on their product, right? Because you have all these influx of data that's coming in. And a lot of the, the owners we deal with, they're like, oh, this person called in, but they didn't book anything. Well, if you let it end there, of course they're not going to book anything, right? But if and that's you the problem, man. A lot of people, even in our industry, they'll make the first or second call. Day one, lead comes in. They'll call twice. Maybe they'll call one more time tomorrow, and then that's it. They're done. They did three calls, yeah. and, and they don't. Oh, it's huge, man, because they don't keep going, like you're saying, 80%, and you got to send me this, you know, this, uh, this breakdown. So I have it because I definitely want to share it with my team. But 80% from the fifth to 12th call, like you got to get to five, six, seven, eight calls if you want to have the biggest conversion. Um, and people just aren't getting there. They're kind of quitting before they get to the good part. Like you, you got you to gotta get there. You know, you got to yeah. hear no to get to the yes kind of thing. Yeah. So keep going, not to cut you off. And, and just, to, just to add to what you just said, in sales, especially when you're selling a financial product like mortgages, or a an investment product, right? Like the good brother Josh and my our family and that kind of thing. No doesn't mean no in our business. No is not right now, right? Mm -hmm. If you, I, I, and I believe this, you will close a hundred percent of the people you follow up. With. So it might not be this year. It could be next year. It could. So you owe it to yourself to stick around, right? And in in our family business, which is the insurance industry, right? The the biggest tragedy I saw was people quitting, right? In the first couple of months, talented guys. When I was like 15, 14, sitting in my dad's office, like, oh my god, this guy's talented. He looks good. He talks good. But they just could not get out of their own way. So that's part of the inspiration for me to really work with people in the sales industry to say, listen, man. In the beginning, everything you touch is going to turn to crap. But if you do your personal branding and you market yourself and you educate people, people connect with you, what's going to happen is in the first year, you might say, oh, my income's okay. But the second year, it's going to start to go up. Third and fourth and fifth year, it's going to quadruple, quintuple because of your compounding efforts. And that's the beauty of selling. Sales is the only industry where you can give yourself a pay raise leaps and bounds strictly from your activity and mindset and perspective for itself, right? When I was working in accounting initially, I'll never forget when I worked for the treasury department, but when, after, before I left the dealership accounting job and then they moved, they moved me to sales. I was in the treasury department for almost four years. And I remember looking at my check at the end of every two weeks going like, this can't be it. Like I just drove to Trenton back. I'm taking the train. I'm getting, this can't be all I'm making. Right. Like, so luckily I had the hospitality business on the side, which kind of jolt started my passion in marketing, working in that business. So when I'm when I'm working with a dealership and we're looking at the budget from the selling side, I'm making sure they're handling their customers the right way. So before you spend a dollar, there's something we call incentive ad marketing. Incentive ad marketing means how are you incentivizing your customers that you already have? Because it's going to cost you four to eight times more money to get new customers and it's going to cost you pennies on the dollar to just incentivize your current database with what you're offering and then upsell them products right so if you're a dealership right you might lose a customer and you might lose money on the deal i tell deal i tell dealership you might lose money on this deal but if you build a relationship with this person they'll service with you they'll do oil changes with you and even better they will recommend people to you so you might lose money or take less of a profit on one deal Right, and they look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, "Oh, this guy's trying to give away the house." I'm not, because you have to be profitable. I understand that, but in that profit, it again, goes back to the word relationship. If you if you sold me a car and you gave me a great experience, that's the best thing for you. Because if I start recommending you, there's no telling what's going to happen. There's no limits to what's going to happen. Right? Some mm -hmm. of my friends who own businesses, my buddies who are DJs, and I recommend them for weddings, and you know, even my wedding planners, our wedding planners, just reach out to us. They're like, "You have no idea how much business." we got from posting you guys and like you guys reposting this stuff like people are reaching out to us like crazy and again i'm not an influencer quote unquote but again people i'm in the demographic where people are my age are getting married right so timing that kind of thing works out but for dealerships then after we d dive through the relationship it's okay you're spending x amount of dollars for these guys because one of the things that happens in dealerships is that there's people every day calling these stores I got this product I can offer you. I got this. I got this. So you have to discern what's a value prop for the dealership and what's just some, another expense. 
So when I audit, I can tell them in real time. Oh, you mean like third party, like vendors calling the dealership to do things for them. Okay. Because the third party vendors, believe it or not, they support the dealerships the most because when people are searching for a used car, by the way, if you're searching for a used car, you got to go to car guru, right? So as opposed to going to auto trader or cars.com, car gurus is good because it's going to tell you and teach you the value you're paying for the car based on the market currently. Is it good or is it bad? Right. There's yeah. certain cars where it's a limited edition. So you're OK paying a little more because it's going to hold its value. But most vehicles, you don't want to even call a store if they're not good or great deal. Right. Mm-hmm. But sometimes mm-hmm. when they're good or great deal on car gurus, that store is pricing the car at a loss. So it's a it's a it's a price. Some dealerships play a game, but they say this price is for financing only. So if you finance with us because they get the kickback from the bank, so the dealerships get a kickback from the bank in order to service that loan Mm -hmm. that helps them stay profitable right so that is the the game that they play with that so from an advertising perspective we say okay what are the people that are going to give you the most opportunities for the money right because dealerships have a ton of money going out the window they'll spend 20 grand a month on mailers that 80 percent people are throwing away and they're not even doing anything depending on what the nature of the mailer is right Mm -hmm. So that is a lot of the things that we audit in the budget. And then we say, where are your influencer opportunities, right? One of the things we just suggested to one of our stores, which we're doing for them, is we're doing an influencer event for them. So they're going to promote. These influencers are going to be there. They can do a meet and greet. They're going to come hang out. And they're going to demo a couple of cars with them. They might sell one or two or three cars that day. You know, they might sell none. But either way, we know how we're going to have a beta test to be able to say, wow, we had this influencer come, this influencer come, and we sold five cars from this influencer, two cars from this influencer. Great. Mm -hmm. Or we got leads. People maybe have bad credit. They couldn't qualify. But we at least know this influencer can get us leads in the subprime market. So it's Mm -hmm. from a dealership perspective, there's a lot of money that goes away. And I think that process in itself is antiquated. So a big part of what we do is we kind of help them kind of slow down the process and modernize their sales process, communication process, and not only that, their marketing process. And the database is huge because now you have every time someone calls and you're only touching them once or twice, your database is growing, but then you're not farming that database. You're not going back. And like you said, for pennies on the dollar, you got all these people here just waiting to, to buy something at some point. Another thing you said, which You know, you never fail if you never quit, right? If you just don't give up, eventually that client's going to come back if you build that relationship, if you stay in front of them. Man, a lot of this is really just, you know, keeping yourself out there, keeping yourself top of mind, Mm -hmm. collaborating, cross-marketing with influencers or even just clients that that are brand ambassadors for you. It's Mm -hmm. funny that I have some people that, they're, they don't have a huge following. They're not anybody, you know, extraordinary per se, but they send me referrals all the time. And they're just like nonstop because they're just a brand ambassador of what I've done for them, whether it's mm-hmm. a first time home buyer, or down payment assistance program. They came, you know, to the table with no money and they're like, oh my God, I didn't think this was possible. And they send me all their people. And on the other hand, I have people that have a huge following, they'll do a deal with me. And then it's like, you know, to get them to post or share, they're like, well, I don't want, really want people knowing my business yeah. or, and that's, I respect it. It's yeah. just that it, 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 it could go either way. Um, but yeah, that, that database and really farming that is, is huge for, for pennies on the dollar. Um, I wanted to ask you a question, just mm-hmm. going back a little bit about going from accounting into sales. Were you like, were you against sales? Were you like, I'm not a salesman? Um, Cause I had that. I was kind of like, Oh, I don't know how I feel about sales. You know, I don't like selling. I- you know, it's funny looking back now, I read, you know, and it's funny. One of the books I read that changed my life was T.D. Jake's Instinct, right? And it ta- Instinct is pretty much your previous experiences guard- guiding you through your current life. So it's like, you know, when you see somebody that makes you feel uneasy, it's because they remind you of a person that did you wrong or might have misled you in the past. Um, when I was in accounting, I remember physically, and you know me, I'm a worker. That was the only time in my life that I was like, I caught myself like calling out here and there and not because I was like hungover or tired, just because I'm just like, when I really think about it, I just, I knew in my heart, I don't want to do this. Right. Yeah. But I knew the knowledge was valuable because I always knew at a young age, I wanted to own a business of some kind. Right. I knew. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I knew the knowledge was valuable. So I appreciated that I didn't throw the opportunity away and mistreat the opportunity. I showed up, right? But uh, I, I caught myself with, you know, if a company gave me, like, for example, when I was in working at dealership, they gave me the same amount of sick days. I barely used them. You know what I mean? So when I got, when I was in accounting, I caught myself just being like, and again, and, and I think the biggest thing in a career point when you're in a field or you're working for a company, if you look ahead to the guy that's been somewhere for 20 or 30 years and you're like, I don't want his lifestyle, you know, his lifestyle doesn't inspire me. He doesn't, it doesn't move me in any way. I knew there was something different I was supposed to do. Um, and then being in hospitality and how comfortable I felt hosting people. And I think the biggest thing in hospitality for me was when people know, because, you know, I guess it's funny, like you're out doing an event, people are drinking, everybody's sharing their problems with you sometimes in a moment. And just being that person that the next day everybody's texting me like, bro, I, compl- I was going through this. And when I left you, I felt better. Right. I think that's my purpose in life is to help people feel better and, and have a different perspective of what they're going through. But back to when I was in accounting and when I went to sales, I felt this like joy, you know, and it's mm. not easy, but I just felt this like not only a purpose, I just felt this like fun in my work. You know, like it felt it, right. It felt like, yeah, it just felt this is like where I'm supposed to be. Fit. And even at, like traditional sales floor right now 2023 it's very tough for sales people because again your customers are walking in um from a automotive perspective they're walking in with with guard up right so it's tough because you're 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 fighting you're kind of fighting uh with either an arm tied behind your back or you're kind of getting jumped because the customer has all these emotions and thoughts before they come in because the person who just bought a car down the road from them is like, they, right. you know, I had a woman tell me a story the other day and I ended up connecting her with one of my broker clients. So she was telling me she was in a, in a dealership and she's a Jewish woman and they took her license and they were making fun of her religion at a dealership. And I was just like, you know, these, but these are the bad apples that my goal is to hopefully kind of reframe and change the way people buy to avoid conflict like that, right? Um, and that was the tr- that was the thing. I knew that I was meant for more and different, and I knew I had natural skills. Um, and that's part of the thing in, in your career. Like right now, you could be in a career, and you could be like, you know, because I was feeling it, and you physically feel it. That's part of instinct, right? So you might mm-hmm. ignore it, but you physically feel like, ah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go there. I, I, you just, you know it. And then, but the beautiful thing is the same skills that you and I possess right now, we can go into the sales arena or the business arena and double and triple our income by using the exact same skills you possess. And once I realized that, that the natural skills that I had, I had to better monetize those skills in an arena that would reward me for sharpening those skills. I, I mean, and my mother thought I was crazy when I left. Because she's like, you left the state job doing this to go do what? You know, and then now she sees how it worked out. Because, again, the, my old employers are now my clients. Mm. Which you is know? all all, all, all uh, um, a tribute to your relationship building, right? To, to keeping that, making people feel good and saying that they want to work with you even after you leave to go do your own thing. Yeah. And they're like, nah, yeah, we, 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 we love you, Bill. We're going to give you the business. Yeah. Um, a lot of gems, bro. You know. I think that when you're, you're definitely that person um, that just makes people feel better. Does that ever get to a point where you're like, I can't deal with people? Like, do you ever get drained from it? Or are you, are you one of those guys that just get like more energy from it? Because then no. who's checking on Bill? You know, who's yeah. making Bill feel good? You know what I mean? I have, listen, my wife does a great job of keeping me at bay and my friends and my, you know, cause my friends are great at that. Like, you know, you're great at that. You're like, yo, how are you? Like, what's going on? Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. see, you, you know, and I have that, those people, but I do get energized when I'm around the right people. Right. Because a lot of people fill your cup that you're also filling their cup. So I, now that in my old, when I was in my twenties, I didn't realize that that portion was draining. Me. So when I left the hospitality business, it was more because I started to feel like, all right, every week we're here, we're doing these events and yeah, it's like, but it's like, I'm dealing with a lot of people and I'm not taking the time for myself to refine my skills and become a better man and, and become a better businessman. I'm kind of just on this hamster wheel of 
next event, next event, next group people, next person's birthday, next person's bachelor celebration they want to do at one of our venues or something like that, or one of the restaurants we're doing marketing for, next, next, and it just became this thing. And the relationships have helped me to this day. But mm-hmm. to answer your question about draining, I don't feel drained. I, I, I love being around people. I feel energized around people. Like, you know, when I'm when I'm in a group and I'm especially when I'm talking about some things I love and I'm helping educate people on something I learned here. I do believe that I've had very unique experiences, right? To go from college and say, yeah, I want to be an accountant because I just always saw like, all right, you can make, you know, 75, 80 grand in account and entry level, which is a lie, right? So it's Bullshit, like, yeah, when you get that, it was a <laughs> lie, right? So I'm like, yeah. I, 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 you know, so being around people and, and joking and laughing and then that's also where I get my most ideas from, like, especially when I'm around women. I love working with women. You know, mm-hmm. like I love talking to my wife about business, like even talking to LP or, you know, shout out to LP, right? When I'm talking to her, she'll inspire an idea by just a statement, right? So mm-hmm. or talking to you or talking to one of our influencers and a brand ambassador, you know, we'll be having casual conversation. We'll be out for drinks at a client restaurant and they'll say something that just sparks a whole different thing. Like the agency started because a woman in California had a conversation with me about how she was profitable in the influencer mm-hmm. space and we were struggling to keep a client i couldn't keep a marketing client to save my life when we started. but now mm-hmm. to have clients that have been working with us for four years and we're celebrating five years as an agency standalone independent this year which is i can't believe it because in accounting they teach you if a company you know a company that's been in business for more than five years what they call a going concern that's the only thing i remember from college mm-hmm. right <laughs> and assets my li- minus liabilities is owner's equity right so those things uh-huh. you know but a going concern most businesses don't last five years. and i could see because we almost didn't last if we kept going to that what's it called but one of the things in business and in life is our motto was improvise adapt and overcome right so when things are going tough in sales or in business, you got to improvise, you got to adapt, pivot, and you got to overcome. And that on the other side of that, that mountain is number one, a bunch of lessons, a new perspective. And that's what I love about business. You can just keep creating, keep revol- keep reviving, keep renewing and adjusting your strategy because times are going to adjust, right? Social media yeah. is here now. Social media wasn't here for my dad. That's why I laugh at my dad. My dad built his business going door to door, show, you know, giving how money works books. And I had the utmost respect for him, but he looks at me now like I'm like a lazy, like, because I sit home, I post something, 10 people DM me, I'll sell two or three product for him. And I didn't even leave my house. And he's just like, I can't believe this. And I, but I'm just like, dude, that's the reality. It's just like advertising to get. Yeah. Imagine this. When we do an influencer campaign, we did one for, um, we just did one for drink. We're doing one for Drink Glow, right? And they, they reported us back the numbers. And I'm looking at, wow, they used our influencer network just by having a couple influencers post. They got, I don't know, 800,000 to a million collective views from five influencers that wow. 20 years ago, that same impression would cost you high six figures, possibly low seven figures for the same attention. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's just interesting in that shift of, of of what's gone and what's coming. But I do. But just to answer the original question, I went off a little bit. But the, no, I, don't feel, I don't feel drained by people. I love people. I love to work with people. I love to learn. But I think the only adjustment to that statement is as a 36 year old dad, I like to work. I like to work with and be around people that also fill my cup. You know, even if they have less than, I don't look at any of that, right? It's just a matter of how do you make me feel? And do I feel empowered by talking to you? Because you learn something from any conversation. From everybody. Right? Yeah. No matter they're a billionaire or someone who just got out of college or, you know, talking to my son, I learned stuff, mm-hmm. you know? So it's interesting, um, but I don't ever feel drained by people, not at all. I mean, you got to take that time, too, because you got to focus. Like you said, we're 36 now, like we're getting older. You got to take time for yourself, for your health. Um, Make sure that you're, you know, not falling into that. What you mentioned about being in that job and your body knowing, like you feeling it like, oh, this isn't for me. That turns Mm -hmm. into disease, right? Mm Dis-ease, like you're just uncomfortable and it could turn into something that, you know, you can't come back from. We're definitely going to have, you know, one of my childhood best friends, Danny Parat, People's Herbalist, 
on the pod in the coming weeks. And that's something he's very passionate about because it's like, you're, you're not, you're not listening to your body. Right. And you made a decision like, you know, I'm in hospitality. I'm going, going, going every day, every weekend, but I need some time for bill. And obviously wifey and baby boy helped you kind of realign some things and, and yeah. put things in perspective, which is a blessing, right? Because you can say, okay, I got to make sure that this is taken care of because I got to provide, but also mm -hmm. that I'm taken care of because I got to be here, right? For my family. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, it, it's, it's awesome to see how you've taken that and put a spin on it. And I ask about the people thing because you're always so like good spirits and, you know, I can be the same way, but I'm, I think I'm more of, a turn it on. And then when I leave, I'm like, oh, I just need to go home and like decompress. And we're both Virgos. We're yeah. both very similar. But that yeah. that piece, I've always just been impressed by you being able to do it. And it's kind of just like always on. And I'm like, I, I got to get out of here. <laughs> and, and and the other thing for me, my my unique perspective on life is, you know, when you in 20, 20, 2008, my parents brought me back to Africa. Right. Um, For the first time in my life, that's where we're from. We're from West Africa, Cameroon, my family. And that was the first time I was there for a month. And, you know, initially you're like hesitant because like, you know, you're so used to, you're an Americanized kid. Like, so you're a first generation. But going back there and seeing people do so much, with so much less was the decision I made in 08 that I'm never going to complain, right? You're never going to see me complain openly, right? I might vent to my friends about an issue, but I immediately am grateful, right? I always have a statement. Any day above ground is a great day. Right. So yeah. if you see me and I'm breathing and I'm here. Right. Um, it doesn't matter. I always say, like, whether I have ten dollars in my account or ten thousand, you'll never know the difference, because if you have life and you were given another 24 hours and another shot. Right. You're here for a reason. And you have to, you know, make sure you fall into your purpose and you make sure you're grateful for the opportunity to be alive. Like today, we're doing a, a seminar at two o'clock for a group. I'm excited because, you know, it's me and my dad together. We're going to do a seminar for these people. And we're going to educate them on stuff that they never heard. Um, and that's the thing I love the most is to, you know, and I, I'm constantly seeking new knowledge. So I wake up every day looking forward to those conversations because you can like you know you you and i went to dinner a couple weeks ago you said something inspired thought of me like you kind of fired me up to like oh, i gotta get on the podcast thing so we started our shooting and you know because again you fired me up to you you kick me in the butt without knowing it and it's like okay like you're being lazy like let's get back to you know doing what you're doing right, right, so right. i i wake up every day just if i open my eyes i look to my right my wife's there i look on the camera or my son's at the edge of my bed telling me he wants to go get donuts or whatever he wants to do for the day I, everything as, is good everything is good so anything that happens yeah. after that is house money as yeah, long yeah. as that's good we're here we can breathe we can eat you have your health and you can walk around on your own two feet because there's somebody today somewhere that took their last breath there's somebody somewhere today that did not get up this morning um yeah so we have to be grateful we have to be grateful I think it's just that perspective, man. You're able to to check yourself, right? Yeah. It just gave you going back to to Africa, and that's awesome, man. That's you know being able to go back and see how, like you said, they're doing so much with so little. Um, I think it just comes down to perspective, and a lot of people don't have that perspective. And I agree with the complaining thing too, like complaining, and that's part. I think that's part of the thing with um, people kind of can be draining or, or being in a place for too long. I'm right. It's time to go. Like I can feel my battery just kind of needs to be recharged is that a lot of people are complainers and there's a lot of small talk and that doesn't really do it for me. But the conversations we have, the empowering conversations, the conferences we go to talking to someone who, I, you know, and again, you can learn something from anybody, but just having those uplifting conversations definitely are like, I could do this all day. It's the ones that are like, ah, oh, you know, the market, the business sucks. The rates yeah. are high. It's like, yeah, but that's for everybody. Like, this is the time to really like turn into that monster, right? Turn into that beast. Like, let's use this and kind of uh, become, you know, become something. And, um, and, and to your point, just to something you just said, which is very, you know, people and complaining, right? So like the real estate market, right? That's your industry. People are saying right now, oh, well, rates are high. This inventory, everybody's a realtor, right? But what you're forgetting is that You've been showing houses for whether it be six months, a year, two years, three years. You now have a database and a relationship with people. So what you should do if you're in real estate or you're a banker, get more licenses to offer more financial products to now help people 
further because you helped them buy their home and they trusted you and you did a great job in that process. Now you should be licensed to offer other financial products to not only generate income for yourself, to help elevate pun intended, right? <laughs> to help Always. elevate your relationship and your view in the client's eyes, because now they're going to come to you for everything, right? right? And now through your referrals, you could be an affiliate for multiple businesses. You could be an affiliate for a car dealership. You could be an affiliate for a home remodel company. You could start. So this is the in these in tough times. That's the time to innovate, and it's definitely the time to elevate. Let's Man, talk about the oh, right that was a bar. Oh, oh yeah, write that down. <laughs> That one hit. So hold on. Let's talk about that. And I know, you know, we're getting, I know you got things to do. You're a busy man, no, but I definitely okay. want to provide this last bit of value for, for people watching. So you're, so let's talk to some of the realtors in that space or even mm -hmm. like lenders. Um, how are you seeing from a marketing professional standpoint with an agency, mm -hmm. how are you seeing realtors marketing on social media? Is it working? Does it need to change? They're walking through the open houses. They got the video. They're sure, like, it's all the same stuff. Or they're dancing yeah. on TikTok, right? Yeah, 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 it's yeah. all the same stuff. How are you seeing that? Do realtors need to become influencers? Do they need to... Uh, uh, partner with influencers, like you said, your story with that girl that you know changed your your idea about the business. You could have easily took that and been like, "Oh, I need to be an influencer," but you mm -hmm. took it and said, "Oh, I need to create this agency that works with influencers." And maybe becoming an influencer is part of the plan eventually, because mm -hmm. it's part mm -hmm. of my plan. Sure. Like, eventually, sure. it's going to grow and the brand's going to grow, and sure. my hats and my sweatshirts are going to sell even more because I am now that. So, gave you a lot there, but just work with that. Let me know what you. I let's go. The, you know, I, got I love the, it. That's the OG too. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, but yeah, like, how are you seeing that? Talk to me about those those points. What, what are you thinking there before so we kind of... One of the things up? that realtors are doing a great job at, which most businesses don't do, is investing in the content. So I see a lot of aerial video, walk around, that kind of thing. But I think, number one, like we I touched on before, expanding the business model of what a realtor is has to change. I think realtors, because me and my father, we you know, one of the things I, ideas I gave him which just came to me out of nowhere. I was actually in Mexico at my wedding. Mm. And one of my friends who is in real estate was complaining. And I literally, I was like, I, I had been drinking a little bit. I've been drinking a lot, actually, that whole week. And I looked at him and I was like, yo, why don't you come do this? And he was just like, that's such a good idea. And it's like, I don't know where it came from. So it's like, I think it's the expanding that. And I think it's the educate, right? I think it's the the podcasting, I think every realtor should be partnering with other financial professionals and exchanging information. I think educating your customers, again, back to that incentive ad, right? Has your database referred you to somebody that's looking to invest in a four or five family, right? Because, you know, especially with everything that's going on in the news right now, people are getting scammed, right? The scam comes from the shortcut. We get scammed when we try to shortcut. I know I've been scammed, especially in the hospitality space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I was trying to take a shortcut, right? I was trying to book an artist. Instead of going through the big agency, I was like, oh, this guy knows a guy. And I almost lost everything I had because I was trying to take a shortcut. So I think yeah. educating people for the fact that it's okay to get rich slow. It's okay to have a long-term mentality. And from a marketing standpoint, partnering with influencers in an educational podcast conversation format is not a bad idea, right? So if you go live with an influencer and you're educating their following on real estate, well, it's only right. And again, just like I tell my clients, you might not get the customer today. They might not DM you today and say, I'm ready to buy a house. Because guess what? The reality is there's realtors everywhere, but there's not realtors that are financial educators everywhere right? There's realtors that can sell you a house, show you a house, show you a more, you know, that there's, there, that's everywhere. But the people that are financial educators and financial coaches, they're not, right? So it, it, realtors are doing a great job investing in their, their aerial shots, the video and that kind of thing. But what about giving an experience video? What about actually walk, giving somebody a sample of what it's like to work with you? Yes, I get it. You're showing me the house. But walk me through, let me see what it's like to work with you as an individual if you're a realtor from the perspective of, oh, wow, this is how the pro you're walking me through this process, A to, a to Z, teaching me what I need to know about money, right? So if you're teaching your clients about money first, which is something that 
we're not taught in high school, right? So a customer is like, oh, I got to buy a house, right? Well, are you helping them audit their finances? And are you the realtor that's saying, hey, you know, I know you want me to show you a house right now, but I'm looking at, I'm auditing your finances and we're talking together. I don't think now's the time. You might have to wait six months. And if you're that person that's doing that, you'll be shocked as to the brand you'll build because you're now truth telling and they're seeing you leave economics on the table, which in the short term, you're like, shit, what am I doing? But long term, what happens is you build a very strong where you're able to do your own seminars and e-webinars that you can charge for. You can charge for financial coaching. You can charge for all these other things that now when the house sale comes around, it's just icing on the cake. Right. So I think just adjusting the strategy and adjusting the education process of buying real estate. There's people, like I said, you look at how many foreclosures there are right now in every country and every county and every cities because people bought houses. Right. Just like the 08 crisis, people just bought houses because everybody says buy a house. Yeah, buy a house. But, you know, I always say your rent is the most you're going to pay when you're renting. Your mortgage is the least you're going to pay. You have phantom costs. You have, so you, if you don't factor all those things in when you're purchasing, you might put yourself in a financial uh, scenario, right? Teaching homeowners about, oh, if you, like Josh was talking about the other day, if you get a life insurance policy, I'm amazed by how many realtors aren't teaching people about insurance, right? Mm -hmm. And again, if you can get licensed on your own and offer them a good product, make it term, right? Offer them a good product. And they're happy because not only they, so now they're more likely to refer people to you. Right. So your incentive ad is growing. Your personal brand digitally is growing because you're educating. And now your customer base is growing and your opportunities are growing. Now you might be able as a realtor to say, you know what, I'm going to build a community. I'm going to go get my broker's license now. And I'm going to now create a little community of our financial education broker that are helping people get to the next level in, in terms of their finances. So I think right now, especially as the market's taking a dip and the rates are high and the prices are high, I think right now is the time where realtors and mortgage professionals, which you're doing, you do a great job. I think everybody needs to follow what you're doing, which is you're educating on not only real estate finance end of it, all around finance, right? So you're doing what mm -hmm. they should be doing, partnering with different people, having these discussions, right, to value somebody. Because if you're helping somebody buy a house, but you had a conversation, you had a live conversation with a marketing guy, and teaching them, oh, well, you own a business. Well, actually, maybe I should take my money and invest it into marketing my business for now. So now when the real estate market kicks back up or it's at a low, I now have the capital to deploy to make multiple investments. Right. At a lower cost. So there's a lot of those. But I think education, building a personal relationship with the brand and, and, and providing value. Any realtor. Right. My sister can come in today and say, listen, I want to show an apartment tomorrow and sell it. Right. That's mm -hmm. not. But if you become a, a coach, an educator, a mentor to people, you know, you'll be shocked as to what the possibilities are for your brand here. Which goes back to that personal brand, which goes back to that database, which goes back to that uh eighty percent of the conversions are you know touch five to to twelve. It's all of that put together, man. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the people that are like, well, I just I'm a realtor. I don't want to wear too many hats. I don't want to do a bunch of stuff. Do you think that's real? Do you think because we have a program with our bank, it's called the hybrid program where agents can mm -hmm. get licensed as loan officers and eat on that side too, because mm -hmm. we see it as one, that's where the industry is going. Sites like Zillow, they have mortgage options. They're, they're basically a bank uh, on their own. And then to your point, these realtors have the relationship with the clients. They have the trust, the no like trust with these clients. And they're already going to refer them to a lender anyway. Just say, hey, I'm actually licensed and I partnered with this bank for these reasons, X, Y, and Z. And we really think that you know, it's better to be a one-stop shop where we have control over the whole process. We can give you these guarantees to make sure that you close. And now they're wearing two hats. So I'm going to give us some pushback on that. What are your thoughts just before we wrap up on that? My thoughts on, on wearing too many hats, right? I used to, so I went through a period in my life where, you know, people try to box you in and give you multiple, like, this is who you are, right? But one of the things I love that Deion Sanders showed us, right? I'm a big fan of Deion is, he was a all-star, not only a two-way player in football, he was also an all-star baseball player, mm -hmm. right? was successful in both. Now he's a coach, right? So if you have one hat, eventually that hat is going to get dingy and it's going to get old mm -hmm. and you got to get a new hat anyway, right? So you're either going to be forced to get a new hat or once this other hat gets dingy, now you can actually pick up another hat 
that you've already been wearing. So as you've been alternating hats that are within the same realm, right? So if you have a, a navy blue Yankee fitted hat, but you also have a black LA Dodgers hat, you know, it's in the same sport, but you just have different hats you're wearing that you pull out at different times, just like you wear hats with different outfits. So it's the mm-hmm. same thing. Or different in seasons or, yeah, you know, different, different kind of hat because so, it's cold. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're in a land, if you're in a snowplow business, right? Yes, you're marketing through the winter. But now if in the spring you start your landscaping side, right? Or you start a property management side, that's not outside of your realm. You're just expanding your reach, right? And I always say constant elevation causes expansion. When you, mm-hmm. you're going to, you have to expand Wait, that, as a person. Who said that? Is that Jay-Z a whole said that. Jay-Z rock said him? That. Yes, yeah, yeah, Jay-Z. yeah, yeah. Love Jay-Z it. said that in the interview, so I have to, I have to quote the GOAT. Um, no, yeah, for but, sure. We're taking that. Know, but that is what it is. Like me, you know, people look at, oh, you're just a, you're just a, people say, oh, you, when you became just a nightclub guy, you became a, what's a ball guy? Well, no. So I started showing them the car show, the networking brunch, the business brunch. I started showing, and then I realized, well, wait a minute. If I can bring a thousand people, four hundred people to a nightclub, if I could bring just two hundred to a business, they're going to pay us a lot of money. So I started shifting. So same realm, but I started shifting. I worked in the car business, so now I realize the sales process is outdated, and the reason dealerships are not succeeding at the level they should is literally because of this. Like my one of my dad's mentors says, the minor adjustments a winner needs to make are so basic and simple. That, that's how most people don't adjust. That's how most people don't win. Everybody thinks the adjustments need to be huge. We don't go into companies and say, you know, revamp this whole thing. No, we're going to tweak this a little bit here, a little bit there, and you're good. And we're going to keep refining it. But it's not about wearing one hat because I think in 2023, it's impossible to do that. If you're wearing one hat, there's too much competition in the area. When you're a little bit more versatile in the area, um, it's a, you have a lot more value because you're covering a lot more ground. It's like an ad. If you're running a social media ad and you search, well, what's people's sports and hobbies? And they put football, right? But if you put all sports, baseball, you know, you're going to reach a, far, a, a higher, a bigger target demographic. So if you want to do a sports podcast, don't just do a football sports podcast. Touch on baseball or have people guests on that are good at hockey and that kind of thing. So you're not wearing many hats. What you're doing is expand, you're wider casting your net. So when the opportunities for your main niche come, your your people are being aware of you from multiple different subjects, but they now know you for that one main thing, but they trust you enough to have different offerings for it. I love it, bro. So before I do this outro, anything else we need to touch on? Anything we missed? Anything you want to share? Um, we're going to have all your links and everything uh, where people can find you. All that good stuff, but anything else you want to uh, you want to share? So, but the, you know, the only thing I would like to just tell people is, look, you know, if you're if you're going through a um, a tough time with this change in market, right? It's just time to pivot. You know, it's time to pivot. It's time to adjust, just like we're doing. Like I said, the reason we started the business development program, full disclosure, is because in Mexico I had an epiphany. Like, holy lord, if Instagram shuts down tomorrow, we're out of business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I had to kind of come to terms with that idea and then say, okay, how can we adjust for that? Um, how can how can I prepare for that, number one? And what can I do to make uh still have generate revenue and provide value? Or where else do I have an expertise? So that is where um that kind con- that that whole thing uh, came about. So uh, yeah, it's constant, constant adaption, constant, constant adaptation, because um, the market's going to change, um, and there's nothing you can do about it. Right? We can complain about it, you know, nothing you can do. You just got to adjust to what it is. So, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. My man. So I have this outro. I don't know if you've heard it. It's from Not a two change song. Oh, okay. So Change has a song called Mortgage Free, which eventually I want to use as like the theme song, but we got to get there. I don't want no copyright issues. <laughs> but he says, the goal in life is to be mortgage free, control your emotions, have integrity. If you want to use my likeness, I need equity. And if mm. you're really trying to win, you need to bet with me. Ooh. And Bill and Bua and Elevate Agency. You already know. Yeah. Two Chains, DJ Premier. Great song there. So my man, I appreciate you jumping on. Um, appreciate you, man. Dropping all those gems, and uh, we'll have all your links in the uh, in the description. 
And uh, let's do it again. I look forward to the Elevate podcast as well. Awesome. Yeah, Sue, so, yeah, come, come end of this month, early December. So I'm excited. So Beautiful. we got to get you on the calendar for sure. For sure. Whenever you need me, I'm there, brother. All right, man. Love you, buddy. Thanks All for having love, me. All love, man. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you soon.